All right, uh, thanks for inviting us. Um, it's a pleasure to present our work here. Um, just to introduce ourselves, that's Sebastian Kui and I'm Philipp Gerd. Gerd, we are both working at the German Archaeological Institute. And we are connecting cultural heritage data, or at least we try to. It's a very small side project of the uh, uh, overall bigger archive project. So as you all know, Syria um, has a very big cultural landscape, which is threatened by the Syrian civil war. And that's why the Museum for Islamic Art and the German Archaeological Institute have launched the Syrian Heritage Archive Project, which is currently funded by the Federal Office for Foreign Affairs. Um, in general, we have two different threats for cultural heritage. Uh, on the one hand side, there's a direct destruction due to the war, uh, like you could see in, in Aleppo, which is under a constant fight and uh, since 2000, uh, 2012. And April 2013, for instance, uh, Umayyad Moshe got uh, partly destroyed. And <clears throat> also on that satellite images, you could barely see how much destruction is going on in the old city of Aleppo. The other problem is the looting of archaeological finds. Um, that is directly, uh, uh, some finds are directly looted from the museums, like uh, it happened in Raqqa in October 2013. But, but there's also ongoing direct looting on the archaeological sites, like in Palmyra. Uh, so the question is, what can we do remotely? Um, so not that much to protect it directly, of course. But a lot of initiatives are uh, trying to collect damage reports on uh, in the internet, like on Flickr, uh, Twitter, and so on. Uh, other programs are um, doing remote uh, sensing, so damage assessment uh, via satellite images, like the uh, UNITA project, United Nations Institute for Training and Research. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what could we do as a museum and research institute? Um, we don't have the money to uh, buy those uh, very costly satellite images, so, and we don't have the manpower to search the whole internet, so what we do is to digitize our data, because we have a lot of them, we have big data, but it's all in analog archives. So um, just to name the most important archives, it's uh, the archive uh, from Max von Oppenheim, uh, who was more or less the German answer to Lawrence of Arabia, who yeah. excavated at Tel Halaf, did a lot of research journeys through uh, Syria before the First World War. During the First World War, there was that German-Turkish monument uh, protection commando under the lead of Theodor Wiegand, and uh, we have the archive of Theodor Wiegand, Karl uh, uh, Wulzinger, and Karl Watzinger, so which all belongs to uh, that commando. And uh, we also have some later archives, like uh, that from Eugen Wirth, who did a lot of research in the 1970s in Syria. So we have a lot of heterogeneous data, and we deal uh, with that data within our IDI world. It's uh, the IT infrastructure of uh, the DRI. And uh, it basically consists of three layers. So we have at the bottom the data layer, where our uh, domain-specific information systems are. Then we have the standards layer in the middle um, to structure and standardize the data. And uh, uh, then we also have, in theory, the analyzers layer to analyze our data, but that's not yet implemented. So perhaps something for future projects. Uh, I want just to briefly introduce the most important points here for the data layer. So uh, Arachni, it's our main object database, it might be known to some. Um, that's how a usual record looks in Arachne 4. Um, it's, it's a screenshot of it, so you see the metadata all in German. <clears throat> and um, you ha have a persistent URI and related objects within the database. When you press, uh, click that link, you get an overview of uh, uh, the related layer, uh, uh, related uh, data sets. And um, that's the usual search interface within Arachne. So on the left-hand side, you have a lot of filter for faceted browsing. And yeah, 
Uh, in a total, we have now uh, 65,000 data sets in the Syrian Heritage uh, Project within uh, Arachni, and uh, most of them are geotagged via the Gazetteer, which will be explained later. So the next infrastructure is the Xenon, which is our uh, bibliographic, uh, bibliographical uh, database. Um, Besides the literature information we have stored, we have also links to uh, the Gazetteer in that case, uh, because it's about uh, Aleppo. And we also have a link to the iDai book browser, where that publication is online available. The iDai book browser is quite similar to uh, yeah, Google Books, but just smaller. Uh, so we have a, a digitize some uh, older publications uh, where we don't have the copyright issues. And um, yeah, there we also have the links to the other systems, so like in that case, Xenon and uh, the Gazetteer. Um, we, we use also that book browser for archival material. So in that case, that's uh, a photo album of Max von Oppenheim, uh, which can be browsed. Right, and the last and newest one is IDI Geo. That's our work environment and uh, yeah, our archive solution for spatial data. Uh, it's using GeoNode, which which is a, a open source framework for spatial data infrastructures. They could upload your layers. Uh, currently, we have uh, eighty georeferenced maps in the Syrian Heritage uh, Project and. Uh, fill in the metadata, which is following an ISO standard, and you could, of course, link also to uh, other data sets. With uh, the layers you have, you could then also create a small web map applications uh, to embed them in other websites. Okay, on to me. Um, what we see here is um, the so-called standards layer that Philip mentioned earlier. Um, I must say that the two applications on the top are right now uh, still in development. Um, the general purpose of the standards layer is to uh, have applications that serve as authoritative resources for all the um, applications in the iDI world. Um, so uh, for the three topics of time, place and general um, terminology. Um, most important for us right now is the Gazetteer. Um, and I'll zoom into it. Um, it's um, our central repository for place data. Um, places in general, also including buildings. Um, and the idea is to have a central repository that we can link to from all our applications um, and um, thereby get geo information for all the um, applications that use the Gazetteer. Um, this is what the Gazetteer applications looks like in the browser. Just a uh, short explanation. We have synonyms for place names, um, geolocation. We also have um, the possibility to store polygons. Um, yeah, all the usual stuff that you would um, want in a Gazetteer. But most importantly, ah, stop. Um, I wanted to zoom down there, so it's probably not really readable, but um, the most important thing um, for our topic today is that we have identifiers of different other resources included in the Gazetteer, and also we have links to other resources, like, for example, Pleiades and GeoNames and um, other systems in the DAI world, and we can um, actually include links to uh, um, every kind of um, resource that is referenceable by a URI. Um, another important thing to note is that we have um, a small button where you can export um, the data in machine-readable formats like GeoJSON, KML, and RDF. Um, and just a short um, glimpse of what our RDF looks like right now. Um, as you can see, it's fairly simple um, because we're of the opportunity that um, simple metadata can uh, do a lot and can help a lot. Um, most importantly, 
it includes links to the other resources. Um, and uh, this allows us to use the Gazetteer as a kind of hub into the linked data world, um, which basically looks like this. So all our uh, systems in the IDI world are connected to the Gazetteer. Um, and as you can see, we have um, a lot of links to other resources on the linked data cloud. Um, very important, the uh, links to Pleiades, and thanks to the Pelagios project, we have a lot of links to other resources that we can gather through Pleiades. Also, GeoNames is a um, very important resource for general uh, place data, um, where we get a connection to DBpedia, and um, through the stuff that's uh, in DBpedia, um, we have a lot of links to other resources, like, for example, what's interesting in the project that we're talking about, um, news about um, destruction in destruction of cultural heritage in Syria. So there is already a linked data cloud that's um, browsable and usable for researchers trying to um, discover new resources. Um, what we, uh, the challenge we had uh, to face, and uh, the video's already running, so pause it. Um, the idea in the Syrian Heritage Project was to um, give researchers an application where um, all the data that's gathered in the project, all the heterogeneous resources, can somehow be viewed together. Um, this is our first try of um, doing that. Um, and we started with a geo-based approach. Um, in this short video, we see the, an overview of the sites that were gathered in the project and stored in the Gazetteer. And as you can see, you can filter um, according to the links that are present. Um, and also, we can uh, view layers from uh, stored in the in our geo server or just on the web, which have also been gathered in the course of the project, um, like old maps of Syria. Um, you can also search for um, important sites in Syria and um, use what you see on the map as a starting point to jump into other systems to browse what's there on the web and what's linked. Um, here again we have uh, Arachne and um, as you can see there are a lot of images that are connected via the Gazetteer to the places. Um, yeah, we have Sinon and we also have Pleiades so it's a good starting point for general browsing um, when, when looking for resources on specific places and specific topics. Yeah, and also here again we have, um, um, through the Pelagios project, these uh, links <coughs> to other resources that are of archaeological interest. Okay, the next example is a video about Aleppo. Here we more or less have a kind of interest side view of Aleppo. So uh, the markers belong to buildings we have stored in the uh, gazetteer. But as we also have uh, polygons available, we could activate those uh, polygons. So they are uh, obtained through cadastral plans we have. But you can also see one problem. Because in the background you see OpenStreetMaps as a map. Uh, OpenStreetMaps here belong, is, is mainly vectorizing uh, Google Satellite. And uh, we have here a small gap uh, of approximately 10 to 15 meters. Uh, and yeah, uh, uh, that's a bit of a problem. The, the question is whether the uh, satellite images are more correct or our cadastral plans. Uh, yeah, but we don't have any ground truthing points, so we can't. Uh, um, um, find the error yet. Um, 
that to go on, we could also then load other data from the geo server in it. So, for instance, uh, the map of the Gaube Wirt publication, uh, where in the 1970s Gaube and Wirt uh, um, mapped all uh, important uh, buildings within Aleppo and built up a very big uh, catalog of, of, uh, about those buildings. And yeah, when you now click on, for instance, here, the big mosque of Aleppo, you get the information which is stored in Arachni about that. <clears throat> However, here we have some kinds of duplicates, but uh, nevertheless, a lot of old pictures from uh, uh, different time spans. Um, the last one are those red dots here, those, this external data um, from the UNITA project. So. That those are damage markers for buildings. <coughs> but here again, we have that uh, gap between uh, the satellite images and our cadastral plans. Yeah. But, but nevertheless, <coughs> just uh, without links, but just with uh, the uh, s uh, spatial extent uh, of the features, you can get also a lot of information uh, together from different initiatives. And the last view of the small application that we developed um, is a little experiment where we uh, try to incorporate different resources that are available on the web. Um, here, just for example, we, of course, we uh, use images from Arachne. Um, we've already seen this. <laughs> um, and um, our little experiment included um, trying to get images from different open resources like Flickr and Instagram um, integrated into what we have in Arachne. The idea was to be able to compare different uh, states of places and um, buildings, cultural heritage objects in these places. And as you can see, you're, always, uh, you're also able to filter according to the date the photo was taken. The idea was to somehow give the researcher a, an opportunity to compare that and to assess the damage. We also try to incorporate Instagram, but as you can see, the results aren't really that relevant. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I think this, this uh, shows that um, geodata and uh, time data offer an, an easy way of integrating, um, integrating stuff that's open on the net, on the web. Um, and to our conclusion, if there is any, um, what we've learned by doing this little experiment and by developing the application. Um, as you saw, we had a lot of links through the Gazetteer, which is a very good thing. Um, but basically, you can only use them for browsing. There's no deep integration, like in the, uh, in the sense of what, what was uh, um, Tim Berners-Lee's vision of the semantic web. We have links, we can browse them. Um, you can do other uh, stuff with links, but so links are fine. Um, but um, what we discovered was that five star LOD, so linked RDF isn't necessarily better um, LOD. We uh, found out that for us, Having geodata and time data in open formats and open APIs is a really good starting point for integrating stuff. Um, because um, linked data tends to be in a lot of different formats, a lot of different standards. Um, it helps, it really helps a lot if you have geodata, time data, and open APIs. Um, yeah, and if you, uh, if, if the data is linked and mapped according to standards, it's uh, even better, but yeah. Thank you. Geodata, time data, open API. <laughs>